To Kill a Mockingbird, Chapter 15, Part 2. A long extension cord ran between the bars of a second floor window and down the side of the building. In the light from its bare bulb, Atticus was sitting propped against the front door. He was sitting on one of his office chairs and he was reading, oblivious of the night bugs dancing over his head. I made to run, but Jim caught me. Don't go to him, he said. He might not like it. He's all right. Let's go home. I just wanted to see where he was. We were taking a shortcut across the square when four dusty cars came in from the Meridian Highway, moving slowly in a line. They went around the square, past the bank building, and stopped in front of the jail. Nobody got out. We saw Atticus look up from his newspaper. He closed it, folded it, deliberately, dropped it in his lap, and pushed his hat on the back of his head. He seemed to be expecting them. Come on, whispered Jim. We streaked across the square, across the street, until we were in the shelter of the Jitney Jungle Door. Jim peeked up the sidewalk. We can get closer, he said. We ran to Tyndall's hardware door. Near enough, at the same time, to scream. In ones and twos, men got out of the cars. Shadows became substance as light revealed solid shapes moving toward the jail door. Atticus remained where he was. The men hid him from view. He in there, Mr. Finch, a man said. He is, we heard Atticus answer, and he's asleep. Don't wake him up. In obedience to my father, there followed what I later realized was a sickeningly comic aspect of an unfunny situation. The men talked in near whispers. You know what we want, another man said. Get aside from the door, Mr. Finch. You can turn around and go home again, Walter, Atticus said pleasantly. Heck, Tate's around somewhere. The hell he is, said another man. Eggs bunch so deep in the woods, they won't get out till morning. Indeed, why so? Called him off on a snipe hunt, was the succinct answer. Didn't you think of that, Mr. Finch? Thought about it, but I didn't believe it. Well then, my father's voice was still the same. That changes things, doesn't it? It do, another deep voice said. Its owner was a shadow. Do you really think so? This was the second time I heard Atticus ask that question in two days, and it meant somebody's man would get jumped. This was too good to miss. I broke away from Jim and ran as fast as I could to Atticus. Jim shrieked and tried to catch me, but I had a lead on him and Dill. I pushed my way through the dark, smelly bodies and burst into the circle of light. Hey, Atticus! I thought he would have a fine surprise, but his face killed my joy. A flash of plain fear was going out of his eyes, but returned when Dill and Jim wriggled into the light. There was a smell of stale whiskey and pig pen about. When I glanced around, I discovered that these men were strangers. They were not the people I saw last night. Hot embarrassment shot through me. I had leaped triumphantly into a ring of people I had never seen before. Atticus got up from his chair, but he was moving slowly like an old man. He put the newspaper down very carefully, adjusting its crease with lingering fingers. They were trembling a little. Go home, Jim, he said. Take Scout and Dill home. We were accustomed to prompt, if not always cheerful, acquiescence to Atticus's instructions. But from the way he stood, Jim was not thinking of budging. Go home, I said. Jim shook his head. As Atticus's fists went to his hips, so did Jim's. And as they faced each other, I could see little resemblance between them. Jim's soft brown hair and eyes, his oval face and snug fitting ears were our mother's, contrasting oddly with Atticus's graying black hair and square cut features. But they were somehow alike. Mutual defiance made them alike. Son, I said, go home. 
Jim shook his head. I'll send him home, a burly man said, and grabbed Jim roughly by the collar. He yanked Jim nearly off his feet. Don't you touch him! I kicked the man swiftly. Barefooted, I was surprised to see him fall back in real pain. I intended to kick his shin, but aimed too high. That'll do, Scout. Atticus put his hand on my shoulder. Don't kick, folks. No, he said as I was pleading justification. Ain't nobody going to do Jim that way, I said. All right, Mr. Finch, get him out of here, someone growled. You got 15 seconds to get him out of here. In the midst of this strange assembly, Atticus stood trying to make Jim mind him. I ain't going, was his steady answer to Atticus's threats, requests, and finally, please, Jim, take them home. I was getting a bit tired of that, but felt Jim had his own reasons for doing as he did in view of his prospects once Atticus did get him home. I looked around the crowd. It was a summer's night, but the men were dressed, most of them, in overalls and denim shirts buttoned up to the collars. I thought they must be cold-natured, as their sleeves were unrolled and buttoned at the cuffs. Some wore hats pulled firmly down over their ears. They were sullen-looking, sleepy-eyed men who seemed unused to late hours. I sought once more for a familiar face, and at the center of the semicircle I found one. Hey, Mr. Cunningham. The man did not hear me, it seemed. Hey, Mr. Cunningham, how's your entailment getting along? Mr. Walter Cunningham's legal affairs were well known to me. Atticus had once described them at length. The big man blinked and hooked his thumbs in his overall straps. He seemed uncomfortable. He cleared his throat and looked away. My friendly overture had fallen flat. Mr. Cunningham wore no hat, and the top half of his forehead was white in contrast to his sun-scorched face, which led me to believe that he wore one most days. He shifted his feet, clad in heavy work shoes. Don't you remember me, Mr. Cunningham? I'm Jean Louise Finch. You brought us some hickory nuts one time, remember? I began to sense the futility one feels when unacknowledged by a chance acquaintance. I go to school with Walter, I began again. He's your boy, ain't he? Ain't he, sir? Mr. Cunningham was moved to a faint nod. He did know me, after all. He's in my grade, I said. He does right well. He's a good boy, I added. A real nice boy. We brought him home for dinner one time. Maybe he told you about me. I beat him up one time, but... He was real nice about it. Tell him hey for me, won't you? Atticus had said it was the polite thing to talk to people about what they were interested in, not about what you were interested in. Mr. Cunningham displayed no interest in his son, so I tackled his entailment once more in a last-ditch effort to make him feel at home. Entailments are bad, I was advising him, when I slowly awoke to the fact that I was addressing the entire aggregation. The men were all looking at me. Some had their mouths half open. Atticus had stopped poking at Jim. They were standing together beside Dill. Their attention amounted to fascination. Atticus's mouth even was half open, an attitude he had once described as uncouth. Our eyes met and he shut it. Well, Atticus, I was just saying to Mr. Cunningham that entailments are bad and all that, but you said not to worry. It takes a long time sometimes. That you'd all dried it out together. I was slowly drying up, wondering what idiocy I had committed. Entailments seemed all right enough for living room talk. I began to feel sweat gathering at the edges of my hair. I could stand anything but a bunch of people looking at me. They were quite still. What's the matter, I asked. Atticus said nothing. I looked around and up at Mr. Cunningham, whose face was equally impassive. Then he did a peculiar thing. He squatted down and took me by both shoulders. I'll tell him you said, hey, little lady, he said. Then he straightened up and waved a big paw. Let's clear out, he said. Let's get going, boys. As they had come, in ones and twos, the men shuffled back to their ramshackle cars. Doors slammed, engines coughed, 
and they were gone. I turned to Atticus, but Atticus had gone to the jail and was leaning against it with his face to the wall. I went to him and pulled his sleeve. Can we go home now? He nodded, produced his handkerchief, gave his face a going over, and blew his nose violently. Mr. Finch, a soft, husky voice came from the darkness above. They gone? Atticus stepped back and looked up. They're gone, he said. Get some sleep, Tom. They won't bother you anymore. From a different direction, another voice cut crisply through the night. You're a damn tootin', they won't. Had you covered all the time, Atticus. Mr. Underwood, and a double-barreled shotgun, was leaning out of his window above the Maycomb Tribune office. It was long past my bedtime, and I was growing quite tired. It seemed that Atticus and Mr. Underwood would talk for the rest of the night. Mr. Underwood out of the window and Atticus up at him. Finally, Atticus returned, switched off the light above the jail door, and picked up his chair. Can I carry it for you, Mr. Finch? asked Dill. He had not said a word the whole time. Why, thank you, son. Walking toward the office, Dill and I fell into step behind Atticus and Jim. Dill was encumbered by the chair, and his pace was slower. Atticus and Jim were well ahead of us, and I assumed that Atticus was giving him hell for not going home. But I was wrong. As they passed under a street light, Atticus reached out and massaged Jim's hair, his one gesture of affection. And we'll go on with Chapter 16 in the next video. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.